Hello, this is Ryan coming from the future again. Uh, in the original airing of this episode, we had the song Time for Death by Guar. Uh, in order to respect the rights holders, we've removed it from this episode. I recommend you find Time for Death by Guar and give it a listen. Thanks for understanding. Hi, and welcome again to the Clive Barker Podcast. Uh, today we are Jose Leitao. Hi. And I'm Ryan Danhauser. And um, our main topic today is Books of Blood, Volume 6, which is kind of a confusing... Uh, it's confusing the way it's been printed uh, in the United States because it's not any kind of short story collection in the United States. It was Those stories were just jammed onto the end of Cabal, maybe to make it thicker. Maybe they thought that would sell better that way. Maybe it did. I don't know. Um, but yeah, those are the same stories... Uh, with the exception of um, On Jerusalem Street, doesn't appear in most uh, Amer- U.S. copies of Books of Blood, Volume oh, 6. Or really? Cabal. Yeah. Oh, that, that makes sense because uh, one time I was talking to someone on a forum, and they, I was talking to them about the ending of of the, the Book of Blood, and they were like, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, it's on the end of the Books of Blood, you know? And I was like, yeah. oh, I didn't. I don't know that story, and I, I can't find it anywhere. And I was like, "Really?" There so are, it turns out, yeah. yeah, there are a few um, hardcover editions of like one through three from the '90s, where they put that at the end of volume three. Mm-hmm. Because in the U.S., the books of blood are only three books. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so is it like um, they have like Cabal, and then they have the four stories in the end? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, really All strange. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, in Clive Barker news, first we'll start off with... And now, the Clive Barker Podcast presents the Occupy Midian Report. The Occupy Midian Report is done by Chris Lorraine from bringbacknightgreed.blogspot.com. The Occupy Midian Movement continues to grow with new members being added to the Facebook group daily, as well as the petition continuing to gain new signatures. Our most exciting news is the screening of the Nightbreed Cabal Cut at the New Beverly Cinema in Los Angeles on June 10th and at the Portage Theater in Chicago on July 13th. For more information on these screenings, visit OccupyMidian.com backslash screenings.html. One of the Occupy Midian group's newest members is Jimmy Johnson, who is the editor on the Cabal Cut of Nightbreed. And Jimmy also edited the recent teaser teaser trailer for the film. For more information on Jimmy, visit his website, jimmyjohnsonhorrorfilmeditor.com. I would also like to extend a belated happy birthday to both Simon Bamford and Nicholas Vince. Speaking of Nicholas, he was able to recently see the Cabal Cut of Nightbreed. His Facebook post regarding the movie said, I was privileged to watch the Cabal Cut on Friday night, and it is awesome. At last, we get to see the relationship between Lori and Boone, more of the breed, and it was great to hear more of Clive's original dialogue. Russell Charrington has done an excellent job of showing what this movie could and should be. If Morgan Creek allows access to the original film stock and further support a release on DVD slash Blu-ray. Nicholas also encouraged any of you who have not signed the petition to do so. So, if you're wanting to see the Nightbreed Cabal Cut, there are a few things that you can do. First, of course, is to sign the petition if you have not already. Secondly, help us to raise awareness about this amazing film. And there are a few more tips under the Take Action tab on the Bring Back Nightbreed blog. With your help, we can get this amazing film into the hands of the masses. And that was the Occupied Median Report by Crystal Rain. Uh, one thing we do want to mention, we've got, you know, kind of a, a, a midway goal here of reaching 5,000 signatures on the petition. Yeah. Um, yes. By the end of the month, which is coming up really quick here, because today's the May 26th, uh, this is really, you know, this is really just our goal. This is our goal to, um, you know, just to keep the pace up. Uh, but I would say that we... Um, you go to the petition website. It's www.ipetitions.com slash petition slash nightbreed. And sign up there if you haven't already or if you know anybody 
uh, you, that would be interested, tell them about it. Get them to sign. Uh, this is our last yeah. big push, so we want to get as many, well, not our last, but this is, you know, for that goal, this is our last big push, so we want to get as many as we can. Yes. Word because, about? you know. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. It's just that, uh, yes, we, we, we would like to reach June with uh, with at least 5,000 signatures. That would be a nice a nice um, goal to get Morgan Creek's attention. So. And we're at 4,100 something right now. So it's not like it's unrealistic. It could right. happen. It could happen pretty easily. You know, if if it gets mentioned in the right spot, or you know, then then uh, there, we've had the way this petition has been working so far is we get huge gluts of signatures all at once, and then then it trickles for a while, and then you know, then more. Uh, so. So that could happen. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, sometimes someone, uh, some kind of like uh, celebrity on Twitter, and I mean, I mean celebrity, not in the, uh, <laughs> the reality TV uh, term, but I mean, if, if like an author or something mm-hmm. on Twitter sometimes mentions us or mentions a petition, that that gives us a big, a big um, boost. boost in the in the number, but. Um, yeah, definitely there are always people who are coming across the petition either through the group or the website www.occupymidin.com. So uh, w- the petition is going to be two months old next week. So for now it's still like seven weeks old. Yeah. And we've already accomplished more than we would ever imagine. I mean, there was a previous petition that was unofficial, and that in three years that got 900 signatures. So we got that in like, I don't know, one month. So yeah. uh, it's still moving forward. and we Keep that like in mind it. that we're in this for the long haul. So, you know. Yes. Once, yes. This, one, this, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, once we hit 5,000 signatures, that doesn't, that's, that's not exactly a magic number. That just means, you know, 5,000 is enough, hopefully, to where Morgan Creek will take notice. Uh, but we want to keep going. You know, we're going we're gonna to keep, uh, keep pushing through. Yep, this is, um, remember, we want Morgan Creek to look for the footage. And uh, because the, the cabal cut right now is done with work print footage, uh, and as amazing as it still is, you know, it's a, not, not a discredit to the uh, cabal cut, as Ryan can attest, but uh, we would really like for a chance at seeing this movie properly restored. So that's yeah. going to take a little bit of time. It's not like, it, this is not like a quick kickstarter where you guys reach like hey let's reach this number of signatures and you know tomorrow we'll have the dvd it's not really like that but you know uh we'll 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 keep you guys posted and since you mentioned kickstarter we've had a lot of people asking why don't you guys do a kickstarter for this and i think that our you know the official answer to that really is that this is not an issue of money uh it's it's an issue of of showing support so that in the future, Morgan Creek will know that it's financially viable. They're not just gonna. They're not. I mean, if if we if we raised money, that would be up to probably Russell Sherrington and and uh, Mark Miller. If they needed money for their their uh, restoration, uh, they would tell us, and you know we would we would get behind that and we would uh, we would push for that. But right now, they're not trying to raise money as much as just. We need to, we need a show of support. So Kickstarter is an amazing thing. It seems like it's done a lot of good, uh, but we don't want Morgan Creek to see us collecting money for something that they own. Right, right. I mean, the, the, all that stuff will be taken care of by you know the production companies, which will be involved in the the future restoration of the movie. It's not yeah. something that the fans need to worry too much about right now. Yeah, and and don't ever get con- when you're signing the petition, don't get confused by the thing asking for money at the end. I petitions the website is asking for money to develop their I petitions website at the end. So once you've signed, and that page comes up, that means you're done. If you really want right. to donate money to I petitions, you can do that, but that has nothing to do with Occupy Midian. Right, just just that heads up because some people sign the petition, they show up on the Facebook group, and they're like, "Hey, they they asked me for money. Is this like for the movie?" And I'm like, "Well, no, it's just 
a suggested donation after you sign the petition for I petitions. So yeah. okay, that's and, that's and, cleared up. And we've had one person say, you know, oh, guess what? I just donated money. I can't wait for this DVD to come out. And it's like that money was for that website. Right, right. So you guys need to keep that in mind. Uh, yeah. I think they make it pretty, pretty clear, but uh, <laughs> yeah. still, you know. Yeah, you can be- just you can just quit right out as soon as once you've signed and they, that page comes up asking for money, you're done. You've signed it. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So. Okay. Uh, well, the next thing, um, tentatively, November or September twenty eighth through the thirtieth, Clive Barker is going to be appearing at Scarefest in Kentucky. And we get a lot of questions about these uh, appearances where Clive Barker is going to be at a at something, and saying why aren't they showing the Cabal cut? Uh, without giving away too much, what we can tell you is that if Clive Barker and Mark Miller are appearing somewhere, the chances are pretty good that they're already trying to get that done. Uh, each venue is a, they have to ask Morgan Creek all over again if they can show, if they can screen the movie. So, um, you know, you just have to wait for an official announcement about whether that movie's going to be shown or not. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're not bashing rocks together here, people. They know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you can bet that they've already thought of that. If you thought of that and it's like, oh, hey, you know, how could Clive Barker's here. How come they're not showing the movie? You can bet that they've already thought of that, too, and they're working on it. Right. Um, So the next thing, and this is really interesting, somebody had asked Clive Barker on Twitter about Aberrant Movies, and his answer was, yes, we are planning not one but five Aberrant films to be co-produced by David Barron, one of the producers of the Potter films. Yeah, I I wish now that we had like a soundboard in our podcast so we could like put a, a noise of people cheering <laughs> that would have <laughs> yeah. been wonderful Yay! Yeah. so this is really exciting news uh, it may be a, you know we've had announcements about Aberat Films before so um, right. that's one thing to keep in mind is that this is really still very early uh, nobody's filmed anything as far as we know, so um, these things are fleeting f- at this point. They're very fragile. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, yeah, so, and, and also, I remember, I do recall that, that Clyde Barker said something um, about these movies in his last um, revelatory interview with Phil and Sarah Stokes. Do you remember that? They asked him, is there anything you'd like people to know about the recent progress around the Aberrant movies? Or are you still in lockdown uh, on that at present? And he said, well, let me put it this way. I can't say very much right now, but the people involved are very committed to what they're doing. We're in active negotiations to make several Aberrant movies, and I think people will be delighted to hear that the people we're talking to are people who are good at making these kinds of movies. Very large scale, very expensive, and very visual and boy, Eberat is going to be, I think, a very different kind of movie. Certainly one thing they have is several hundred pictures as points of reference. These people are good at making these kinds of movies, and it isn't Disney. Yeah. And Rep- said, Perfect. So this this was before Clyde Barker mentioned that on Twitter. So Yeah, yeah. So um, that, that was um, last month, right? Um, yes, this, this was, uh, this was on the uh, last interview they did, which was in uh, 12 and 14th of March, 2012. Actually, it was a while ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Two months ago. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so yeah, um, really cool. It seems like it's moving forward, you know, but this one kind of like the Nightbreed TV show, we would, I would feel a lot better when we see more evidence like real like advertising or something you know well yeah you know these things are what we call uh a limbo a pre-production yeah. Limbo. yeah so you never know these are things that depend on a lot of factors money production yeah. uh, schedules and all that stuff so yeah uh, yep just hang in there and you know uh, I'm sure that they'll keep us posted on the development of these things. And people are debating online about whether it should be animated or whether it should be live action. And, 
you know, with CGI, you know, I'm I'm happy to see anything. I don't, you know, whatever they want to do, I, I I'll be buying a ticket and going to watch it. Uh, yeah. Well. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I was. I was just gonna mention uh, movies like The Plague, but you know. That's, <laughs> that's, or, that's or not, yeah, Rex. that's not based on any Clive Barker uh, writing, I, though. I know. Well, Dread was, um, but yeah. let's not get into that. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's that's probably about all we can say about that. Um, the next thing is. I uh, want to give a shout-out again to Rue Morg. Uh, that magazine-slash-website has been really supportive of, of Occupy Midian and the Nightbreed um, yeah. movement. And uh, they did an article about the new upcoming screening in Chicago. So, so you know, Rue Morg is awesome. Everybody should, should buy their magazine. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we... We love uh, reading all these websites like Rumor, like Fangoria.com, you know, yeah. uh, all these websites really that are getting involved in uh, spreading the message like um, Bloody Disgusting and uh, Shock Till He Drop uh, and all these, these great people who write the articles and who are also members of Occupy Media and the group. So we thank all of them. Yes, oh, definitely. And they have made a huge difference in our the numbers of our you know facebook members but more importantly the number of uh petition signatures that we have absolutely absolutely yeah so that's about all the news that we have for this time um we can if you're okay we'll move on to the uh, main topic Let's do it. Yeah, so Books of Blood Volume 6, the first story, and I don't, I can't remember if these are rearranged on the American version. I just read the UK uh, version, uh, reread the UK version. So uh, the first story on that one is The Life of Death. Yes, that's what's on my sphere paperback. Yeah. Life of Death. So. And this is a really interesting uh, story, and, and Clive's been sort of quoted as saying that. Dread was the only story of his that didn't involve some sort of supernatural element, but I think that you could make a case that this one doesn't either. For mm. the most part, it does maybe a little. little. Yeah, it's hinted. I think that there's supernatural stuff in it, but not overtly so. Yes, I mean the narrator at one point is dead, and it's yeah. still. That's true. The action. So yeah. So I guess to do give a little one liner on this, uh, Elaine, um, Elaine having just uh, been through a hysterectomy is um, finds herself mourning the loss of you know being able to have children that you know that part of her body that's gone and and uh, or the you know the of her insides and and is. Um, she wanders by a church that's being demolished, and there's a tomb underneath. And mm-hmm, there's a, a, a plague, yeah. A, yeah, a crypt that turns out to be a plague pit. And mm-hmm. in that plague pit, she sort of comes to uh, terms with death. I think would be kind of yeah. the teaser way to put it. Uh, I guess, and. Um you know, it's like she she uh, one of the th- one of the scenes in the beginning of the story that really that really uh, stood out and you know stayed in my mind was uh, the fact that that she mentions uh, once she had the the surgery done and she goes back to work and you know we're talking about this this woman she's a character that represents a vulnerable broken woman who yeah. you know had half of her inyards as they say removed. Yeah. And uh, she mentions that her coworkers are a bit weird around her, and then what her boss actually tells her at the end of the day, "Well, you've been crying all day," and she and didn't even like, notice. Yeah, she's like, "No, I haven't. I never cry." And he said, "You're crying right now," yeah, you know, so, which is it's a really interesting kind of a touching little thing that he puts in there. It was a really good characterization. Yeah, it just sets the tone for this character, mm-hmm. and you know, it's um. Another th- interesting thing that is n- only briefly hinted at is that she's got either a boyfriend or a fiance that we never meet or see, or she—it's just like he sent her a scarf in the mail, and and uh, 
it's like he feels bad, but he never she never meets with him or talks to him on the phone. He doesn't come around. Right. I mean, right now at at the story beginning, she's like she's she's turned herself into a almost a Walking Dead emotionally. I mean, yeah. she's like even when she meets the guy in the crypt, which we will get to further ahead, and he asks her, "Do you want to go for a drink?" She's like, "Ah, I still don't have the stamina." I just you know she. She looks at him. She says that she's not unattractive, but yeah. her inner dialogue is like, "I don't want to be with anybody right now." She's yeah. she's still feeling very scarred and tender, yeah. so she can't even think about getting emotionally involved. So she also, I think her her self worth has gone down quite a bit. You it know, and, a and I don't know if you want to people. talk about the graphic novel separately, or we can kind of go back and forth. We can go back and forth. I think the the graphic novel did a really good job of making her look plain and unattractive at the time when her self esteem was really low, mm-hmm. and when the when the story sort of turns a corner, um, she changes and becomes more attractive in in yeah, the artwork, she, which is kind of a cool way that they did that. She takes off her glasses, and you see her hair is looking better, and all that yeah. stuff. She's it is, not it kind is, of downward uh, cast and looking depressing. And yeah, yeah, because she feels special after a while. You know, it's like yeah. when once she goes into the church, this church is going to be demolished, and uh, and she finds this guy in there called Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh, yeah. And he's like, he's interested in um, the tombs and you know the, the the artwork and all that stuff. And he seems to be a pretty harmless guy. He seems to be a, you know, kind of a charmer in some ways. I mean, not overly charming, but he's doing, he, he's just checking it out, and they, they want to see it before it gets destroyed. And she actually finds a door, and she sneaks into the crypt. And like you said, she finds that it is a plague pit. Yeah. Uh, apparently, there was at some point in history a plague in that place, and they just, uh, like they used to do in plague times, they just uh, got the people as they died. They just threw them into the crypt. And it and seems like maybe some of them weren't even dead yet. They just they threw a ton of people in there and sealed it all up. They sealed yeah. it so tight that these people were all still fresh by the time she opened the door and went in there. Yeah, they're just they're, their bodies have been half preserved and they're still a little slimy mm-hmm. or whatever. And she comes. And they started across. to decompose immediately when she opened the door. Exactly, because the oxygen has started to go into the crypt, and you know it, it's it's accelerated the decomposition. And she comes across this fascinating mane of hair from a woman who's um, in the middle of the corpses, and she she actually she actually uh, pushes one of the corpses away to see the woman, and it's almost like um, you know kind of like. Kind of like a mirror image of her, yeah. but I mean, not in terms of physical aspect, but in terms of, um, in terms of like, she she feels almost as dead as her, and it's like, yeah, she's also she also has this detail, which is, um, her legs are spread open at a weird angle, and you see the blood in the middle of her legs, and she questions herself that she did this woman died giving birth or something, yeah, and was it some kind of disease that she had? In you know, in her you know, lady parts, like 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 she did, because she had like cancerous tumors, mm-hmm. and so she touches the corpse and she stains her fingers, and that's when death s- jumps into her. I mean, it's yeah. like death is kind of like a um, death is kind of like a a a thing here, a physical yeah. thing, almost this, like a presence. And this disease yeah. uh, chose her to be a carrier rather than an aff- afflicted. Yeah, and, and like you said, as the story progresses, instead of her getting progressively sicker and dying, she actually feels better, and she starts to feel special somehow because she saw death. Yeah. And she kind of like, it gives her like a reason to feel special. She gets really, really hungry where food disgusted her before. Now she's now she's ravenous, and she's feeding what she sort of calls this this feels like this child growing inside of her. So that's another really interesting thing because she feels connected to death because of her hysterectomy and the cancer. Uh, but she also, and she can never have a child again, but she also feels like she's nurturing this child, which she learns later has become this disease that she yeah. can spread to other people to pretty much instantly kill them. So she actually becomes a mother of death. 
Yeah. So <laughs> she becomes the life of death. Mm -hmm. And Kavanaugh, they they get to meet. Um, they get to meet eventually. And Kavanaugh kind of like follows her around, right? He's like stalking her. That's when we find yeah. out that Kavanaugh actually is so fascinated with death. He's a serial killer, and he thinks of himself as the embodiment of death yeah. in some way. And, and there were hints to here and there that she wasn't really paying attention to, but, you know, he's kind of socially inept. He's uh, He dresses funny. You know, he wears a weird little bow tie, and he... Um, a green tie, yeah. Yeah, and he's... Um, he's, he's kind of plain-looking, but he, he, he says the odd comment here or there that just makes her think... You know, that just sort of sticks out and like, whoa, you know. And and it's interesting that, you know, Clive Barker seems like he took a, a little aspect of himself and sort of expanded it out and into this exaggerated... Because he loves, you know, he loves graveyards. And, uh -huh. and uh, so that kind of aspect, like, like Kavanaugh and that kind of aspect of himself, it seems like he sort of expanded out into this kind of creepy uh, serial killer character of, of Kavanaugh. <laughs> Uh, right, I mean, and uh, it's like, well, you know, it's like, um, so yeah, so, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, so the, this woman, Elaine Ryder, um, so eventually, uh, th this story uh, has one of those little things, it's like, well... You know, these two people are going to eventually meet up and... Elaine doesn't really seem to notice or care too much, but uh, one of her co-workers, who everyone says, you know, this is the person who gets sick before everyone else in the office, uh, got sick. She got this plague. She had blood come out of her nose and her mouth. Uh, she fell over in the bathroom, and and, uh, and later on... that. Elaine finds out that this woman died and Elaine sort of turns a corner as a sympathetic character when people are dying around her and she doesn't care. Right. It, she kind of feels a little detached from it because yeah. I guess that's that's the um, that's her you know persona turning into the play carrier and she feels I think I is it safe to say that I think she feels more alive now that she's a plague carrier? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the impression that I got, that yeah. every time someone dies, she kind of, like, feels a little more alive. Yeah, so, and, and she feels, yeah. she, she's really fascinated by this news story of a man, uh, a man on a yacht, and this, the, a sailboat who was stuck out in the middle of the ocean uh, for f four days, I think it was. There was no wind, or was it four weeks? I can't remember. Uh, but there was no wind, and he was getting cabin fever, and he tied himself to to on a rope to the boat and just sort of swam out just to get off of the, the boat for a little while. And he got this weird feeling coming over him, like, what if I just untied myself and just float away? And uh, and he looked back, and he saw a man standing on the on the deck. And in the in the TV interview, they said, uh, "Who do you suppose? Who was that? You know, was that a stowaway or what?" And he said, "Oh, it was death, I suppose." Yeah, that's the Michael Mabry episode that that's in the story. It's it's a nice, it's a nice little story within a story. Yeah. yeah. It makes you kind so of I, wonder what the genesis of that was. Was there maybe a story like that that Clive had known about? Oh, you know, I mean, I, I have a few books that mention, like, uh, well, living in a coastal city that has a lot of, like, fishermen, I've read all sorts of stories about people who got lost at sea or that their ship wrecked or something, and they were, like, floating in the ocean for, like, hours or even days. And uh, there's always all that, all sort of fantastical stories when people are spending a lot of time inside the water, mm -hmm. and they start to see things and all that stuff. So... Uh, being from Liverpool, I'm guessing that Clive also knew a lot of those stories. That could be, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Even on even on Galilee, there's there's some stories of, you know, when Galilee is lost at sea and he decides to kill himself, and then he starts seeing things. Yeah. So, yeah. Um. So yeah, basically, uh, she meets with Kavanaugh eventually, and their trist can I can I yeah. call it that? <laughs> it doesn't go very well because he's a killer. Yeah. And uh, and she and it's also important to know that she's decided that he is death. 
And mm-hmm. so she's giving in to him. There's this kind of almost like a sitcom sort of a conversation where they're that they're having where she's understanding the conversation to be going one way and he's understanding it to be going another way. And the police have been investigating her because her friends are all dying from this disease. And yeah. he's assuming that the police came around her house because he's a serial killer and she's with him. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he's he's wanting to know why the police are coming around and, you know, how did you know about me? And, and she's saying, oh, you know, I knew, you know, I, I knew you you talked about how much you love death. And, you know, boy, mm-hmm. you're, that was really uh, self-conscious or self-centered or, you know, whatever she said and or egotistical, I think. Oh, that the, the one says when someone cries over the dead, it's kind of selfish. Uh, no, he had uh, he had said. um because uh, there's a part where Kavanaugh reminds yeah. Elaine that uh, when one cries over a loved one's death, it's a selfish response. Yeah, because and, they're, they're sad for themselves. Yeah, and then he tells her, you see how much the dead can teach just by lying there twiddling their thumb bones? Which is a wonderful, yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful little image. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, so but, she thinks he, that he really is death, like, you know, like the, the sailor saw in on, on, yeah. on the deck of his ship. So she kind of goes like, okay, I'll, you know, I'll go along with whatever you want to do. I'm your death. You, you know, you, she doesn't say that outright. And he's just thinking like, oh, this lady knows I'm a serial killer and she doesn't care. This is awesome. And he actually thinks of himself as, you know, the, the living embodiment of death as well. I mean, he kind of yeah. has that, you know, mental image of himself as being death. And uh, he strangles her yeah. after they have sex. And it's, it's, it's a weird and it scene. sort of falls apart in i mean their conversation sort of falls apart when he's when he's saying yeah i'm so neat uh they they must admire me for being neat i never spill blood and she's like oh you you, you spill blood sometimes but i don't you know that's okay i forgive you for that and he's like what mm-hmm. lies have they been telling about me i never spill blood and and then she's starting to kind of realize wait a minute something's not right this is not what I thought it was, and by the time she figures that out, he, like you said, he's strangling her. Yeah. And then the rest of the story, we see it through the eyes of Elaine's ghost. I mean, Elaine's yeah. ghost. Yeah. So there's so, the sort of paranormal aspect of it. And if you could think of this disease as a little bit paranormal, too, or or uh, it's not, you know... It, and it, it's fascinating, because it's like this, this death, this plague, yeah. it, it's almost like a... a it's almost like an entity that takes possession of people in this case. Yeah. And she was a plague carrier, and by having sex with Kavanaugh, she delivers him into the actual embodiment of death that he sees yeah. himself as, because now he's the plague carrier. Yeah. And as he raises himself from her body, she's she's seeing him walk out the door, and she knows that now he's the one who's carrying that plague around. Yeah. And, you know... He actually has been delivered into a new life like she was, the life of death. And it feels a little, it's a little odd, the ending of this story, because it's, you know, you don't expect the person that you've been following and sympathizing with to be killed, and the man who's a serial killer who killed her goes on his sort of merry way at the end, and it doesn't, mm, it yeah. doesn't exactly feel like justice, but it's, a, it's an interesting kind of a poignant ending. And it's a, it's a nice twist. And uh, it, did you get the feeling that I got this feeling that almost like this plague always required like one carrier? <laughs> yeah. And it's like it would spread itself. It would like it, almost like it would find a way to spread itself, but it wouldn't kill its carrier. Yeah. So she doesn't get sick. Her coworkers get sick. Yeah, she and, feels and great. They, yeah, and then she sees this guy as carrying within himself the same death that she had inside her and he goes on we don't know if he got sick and died or if he's going to be like another vector of disease just walking around and feeling great yeah until it's like caught by the police or something i don't know so it's like there's kind of a there's kind of a hint of a paranormal thing around this death this entity this physical plague that's in the story so i really enjoy that yeah you know it's 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 not the uh not the most not the greatest uh well, I don't mean to say that. I think I think I'm being a little mean. I'm just saying it's not the best story for me of the whole book. That's going to come up mm-hmm. next ahead, but uh, still, it's a nice story. They, yeah. they did a graphic novel for it. Uh, yeah. At the Eclipse graphic novels, and 
Who adapted it? Do you know? Oh, uh, yeah. Stuart Stania and Hector Gomez, and uh, stories are Fred Burke and Steve Niles. Right. Hey, there you go, Steve Niles, who also Twittered about uh, <laughs> Occupy Median. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it, on that graphic novel, The Life of Death, uh, at the end, there's also this, the adap- adaptation of, of New Murders in the Rue Morgue, which is kind of cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so our next story is How Spoilers Bleed. Uh, mm-hmm. And this is, uh, this to me, you know, this to me sort of embodies... Uh, the feeling, the overall feeling that I had about the Books of Blood, it's yeah. such a bloody story. It is. It is, isn't it? I mean, this book has a couple of stories that deal with plagues. And uh, yeah. and it's like, even in the first story, the people die because of a plague that makes them like bleed out or something. And this yeah. one is also, uh, uh, and they become extremely... Fragile, and they just anything, even like motes of dust in the air, will will, will hurt them, and they start yeah. bleeding and splitting up. So, uh, what it is is uh, Cherik, Stumpf, and Locke. They're yeah. three three men who had, I think, this is in Brazil, right? Bought a large part of the jungle in Brazil, uh, and it's kind of discussed later. They didn't really buy the land; they just bought the rights to uh, screw over the, the native population any way that they felt, so that the government would turn a blind eye. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so they their confrontation. I mean, they're first of all they're dealing with the jungle, which is a brutal place to be. Uh, and but second, um, they're having to deal with the you know the native population who have already been decimated. And they've sort of got a camp set up here, and they're, you know, trying to make them leave. And yeah. and what the, the result, what ends up happening to them based on that. Yeah. Um, actually, this, this story has um, a very valid and still meaningful message, because even now in Brazil, in the Amazon and... You know the, the the rainforest. There are still people who are like uh, like lumber companies and stuff like that. Yeah. That they are still destroying a lot of places where all these tribes live. And then just recently there was this dam that has been uh, approved, which is going to flood a part of the uh, rainforest. And there was one one tribe that is going to be basically extinguished because. That's the area that's going to be flooded is the area where they traditionally lived for countless generations. So, yeah. um, so this story has a, a, a environmental message. It has a social message, yeah. and it has you know the fantastic elements. Yeah. And, uh, and and I, it's it's an interesting one where Clive Barker puts us you know puts us in the position of having main characters who are awful. Yeah, you know, they're it's not, not uh, usually they're a little sympathetic, or you can kind of put yourself in their place. But yeah. in this case, you just you're just thinking, I do not want to be here at all. Right, and right. you combine that with a kind of the kind of body horror, I guess that that you know comes from this curse that's put exactly on this kind of body horror and this kind of plague that comes from from sub- stories like the Red Death from Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah, or you know. Jack London's um, The Scarlet Plague was was it that? I think I read something about that once that Jack London story where it's like the future and it's like there's only a bunch of people that remember the Scarlet Plague that decimated the world. Hmm. It's always this this idea that this dissolution of the body into blood that it's so yeah. repugnant. Like the fact that you these guys are morally decayed and their bodies also reflect that moral decay along yeah. the story. In, in the description of them, each one of them is ugly in some face, some way. Like one guy's face looks like hamburger or something like that. And yeah, they're 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 ugly inside and out. Um, they're morally, you know, they they're morally just you know terrible. Yeah, they they, and not only that, they don't even see themselves as doing anything wrong. Yeah. They don't see themselves as deserving of punishment, even though in the beginning of the story they're trying to get this tribe to move out of the land, and, and they're confronted. Yeah, they're and, confronted by this this uh, wise 
old uh, man from the tribe. Yeah. Who is a blind man, I think, isn't he? Uh, yeah. He's blind, but he walks out confidently, you know. Yeah. And he confronts, I think it's Cherik. And, yeah. uh, and Cherik is just god awful. He's, yeah. I mean, out of all of them, they're all bad, but he's, he's just terrible. He, he sees them as, he, he kind of sees them like monkeys in a way, like, you know, it's, they're just nothing. They're just in their, in his way. Yeah. And, and he tries to use a gun to, um, scare them off. Unfortunately, he shoots a gun and, a boy comes out of a hut and he's mortally wounded and it yeah. turns out he just shot and killed a, a, a native boy yeah and and the this this old man he opens his mouth and he he curses them yeah with a curse that is almost like the jungle opened up and spoke right yeah like, he, he, it's it's a whole lot of really really good imitations of jungle sounds and it almost sounds like he's sort of channeling the jungle in a way. Mm-hmm. Because the jungle is also very inhospitable for the European colonizers. Well, yeah. well they're not colonizers, but they're like uh, intruders in a way. Spoilers. And for them, <laughs> spoilers, exactly. Yeah, that's that's where the title actually comes from. They're despoiling the, the jungle. And yeah. uh, it's like... And they're sick because of it, because the, the jungle is a place where it's like life is running wild. Yeah. And it's like where there's too much life, but there's also a, a lot of death. So yeah. they're always sick. They got all these fevers going on, and they're like, oh, I hate this place. Yeah, you know? and Stumpf has like dysentery, I think. Is it Stumpf or Locke? I can't remember. Has dysentery yeah. when and he doesn't even want to get out of the Jeep and translate. And they haul him out of the Jeep so he can talk to the to the elder, and he just speaks bad Portuguese. And, of course, this tribe doesn't speak Portuguese. Right, right, right. Yeah, and, um, and there's also this city character who's the, uh, who's the trading post manager. is a man called Tettleman. Which will yeah. he will also show up later in the story at the at its resolution. Yeah. But um, and you get so the, the feeling that Cherik is just horrible. The other guys don't want to. They don't want to use violence with the tribe. Probably not because they, they are morally superior to Cherik, but more because they're afraid of getting overrun by them. Yeah, exactly. Because, like you said, for them, for for. Um, for uh, Cherik, is it Cherik? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's the Cherik is the first. The guy right, right, the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Cherik is like you said. He's thinking like he can just shoot these guys away like monkeys, and he wants to get. You know, they they want to they want to plunder the um, the jungle. They want to. I don't know. I don't remember exactly what they want to do with it. They want I, I don't to do think it's ever really lumber. said whether it's a mine or what or lumber or what they're planning on doing. Yeah, it's something like that. They want to. They want basically. They want to plunder the whatever resources are around. Yeah, I think that's so, deliberately vague because it you know it, in this in the context of the story it's not important. Yeah, we could have used Captain Planet showing up on this story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these guys are so typical textbook villains. Yeah, but. Uh, so yeah, so so Cherik kills the boy. They get cursed, and yeah. um, because they killed the boy, they're like, "Oh, let's get out of here," you know. And, and it's interesting how this story starts out with it starts out with them talking about how Cherik died, and then it's like, "Okay, let's backtrack and talk about how it all happened," and and then it, it, the story goes until it catches up to that point again. Yeah, it, 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 the story opens up with them like burying Cherik, and the Indians after they bury him, they like stomp on his grave and dance. And it it, it, it feels yeah. like to the to the other guys, it feels like they're dancing on the grave, and I think they really are. <laughs> yeah, probably so. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that that's like you said. So they mention how this all started. Yeah. And after they get cursed uh, that night, I think that uh, Cherik goes to sleep and. Especially in the graphic novel, we have this beautiful visual image of this bug landing on top of Cherik as he sleeps. A dragonfly, I think, right? Yeah, and it starts walking on uh, on his skin. And his little paws, where they're walking, where they're walking on his skin, the skin splits and it starts bleeding from those little So there's like little, little bug footprints in blood going up this guy's body. 
Yeah, yeah, and that's that the curse. Big... Lock. Or no, that was, or no, yeah, that was. Which which guy was that? Stump for. Oh, am I, am I mistaken here? Let me, let me recall. Hang on. Oh no, I think you're right. I think that was that was Cherik. It's Cherik, right? That's yeah. how it begins. Yeah. 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 Right. So and, and, uh, he come. He he hears people talking about him, and he comes out, and starts yelling about you know like he only he had the the balls to to shoot the kid, and nobody else would have done it. And yeah, and, and he's it, feeling horrible. He he's yeah. Feeling terrible. Yeah. yeah, and his his he's he's kind of bloody from this, you know, dealing with the bug, and his clothes are chafing him, and and uh, yeah. he's really mad, and he slams his fist down on the map that they've got laid out on this table, and this oh, God, is like yeah. this this scene sort of embodies the whole story for me. There's just the horror of this when he slams his fist on the table, his hand kind of explodes and just blood yeah. everywhere. Yeah, it's like he's it's like he's um he's made of, you know, a thin sack of blood yeah. and all of a sudden he slams his hand and there's like, yeah. blood everywhere. And he goes like, Oh my god, you know, and, and then some guy goes behind him and holds him and it's like, Oh no, don't touch me and when when the guy holds him under his shoulders he feels like his flesh is separating from his bones or something. And it and is it's, probably and and uh he, and then he he falls down on his knees, and his knees get all bloody. And the the yeah. guy who's sort of the camp doctor or whatever comes over. He's like, "Here, let me help you out." And it's no big deal. And try grabs his shoulders to try to lift him back up again. He's like, "Ah, oh, oh, don't God. touch me! It's worse." And then if they're oh. then they're all watching and they're horrified and just waiting for him to die. And he falls over. And <sighs> yeah, that's horrible. That's the like you said. That's the moment where. That's that's the moment of the story right there where you yeah. start going like, holy crap, what's going on here? Yeah. And that's when you realize that that's the curse that's starting to take place. And yeah. um, no. and basically all the other guys are, are going to follow him yeah. toward the same fate. Except, of course, that maybe they start to realize that they, they did wrong. And even though... Yeah. They feel like they didn't deserve their their faith. They start getting to terms with their own moral decay. Yeah, and before that happens to them, they meet up with that store owner. Um, what was Kettleman? His? Kettleman, yeah. And Kettleman's like, "Hey, you know, I make my living off of these guys. They come up here and they bring like pots uh, that they made, or they'll sell a parrot or whatever, and I sell them to the to the U.S. or wherever he's. I, I don't remember, but he says so, but." If I help you to get rid of these natives, you need to cut me in on what you guys are doing. And they're like, yeah. okay, well, how can you help? He says, uh, "He says, well, they're really susceptible to disease, which is sort of interesting, an interesting sort of counterpoint to the, you know, what's happening to these guys. Exactly, exactly. So the, the, these white men are getting this, this disease that's going to wipe them out. But in return, the... The Indians are also susceptible to the white man's diseases. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, they um, they say he says, well, how do you do that? I mean, we don't have time to wait around for them to get diseases. And he goes, no, no, you you give them you give them corpse blankets uh, from smallpox and whatever, and they'll these guys will die almost overnight. Yeah, it's you know this this might be a little tasteless to mention, but that's that that happened a lot. Not only in Brazil, but also in in oh, the yeah. U.S. Yeah, missionaries. Native Americans. Yeah, missionaries yeah. gave out. Uh, you know, they thought they were doing. You know, they thought they were doing the, the nice thing by yeah. handing out blankets, and these blankets passed along disease because they didn't wash them like you know we do today. Just kind of amazing to imagine mm-hmm. that that these people live in a jungle. They you know they live in contact with all sorts of life and yeah. all sorts of like abundance of creatures around them and still there are diseases which we take for granted because we've been living with them for centuries yeah but and we never- yeah and we've yeah. we've worked out you know our bodies have finally become immune yeah but there are people in the world to whom you know you sneeze on them and that's it game over they yeah. they, they get over and they die you know, while we have the sniffles for a couple of days, like you had once during yeah. a podcast episode, <laughs> yeah. uh, you just sneeze on them and they just like keel over and die. It's like, ugh, there we yeah. go. 
because they never had a cold before. So, yeah. so but in this well, case, these guys are deliberate. like resting up in town. Uh, one of them, I think, uh, Stumpf, mm-hmm. locks himself up in a hospital and is um, he, he gets this airtight room. He's got a patch yeah, but, over his eye, a bandage over his eye, and and he's he won't let anyone yeah. in the room. He won't let doctors anywhere near him because he knows yeah. that he's got the disease too. And he calls yeah. on Locke. He says, you know, he, he sends a message to Locke, and Locke's like, hey, I'm not interested. I'll come whenever I feel like it. And he finally comes over, and they, uh, you know, they talk, and, and Stumpf is like, hey, you've got to, you know, I'll give you my share. I don't care, but you got to meet with that chief or that elder and tell, yeah. get him to forgive us, get him to call off this curse. And Locke is like, it's not a curse. And he, the more he talks to him, the angrier he gets. He opens the door and the dust motes in the air kill Stumpf. Basically, they kind of like pierce him. It's yeah. like, well, it's not just, a, it doesn't just open the door. Actually, he, he bursts through the, the, the glass window. Mm. And uh, it's also the glass and all that stuff, all the air and, and glass that, that falls on Stumpf. It yeah. cuts him open like a thousand little nicks and, uh, and he dies. But here's the thing. And, you know, it's like the clean room that he was in. So, And then yeah. the only one left is Locke, right? Yeah, Locke walks out like, you know, he it, it, it's like all he can think about is, yeah, I got to get back to that village and get that, uh, get that elder dude to forgive me so that I don't have this curse anymore. I'll even get, he's like, he's being so generous, I'll even give him the land back. And, yeah. and all, he doesn't think once about how he just murdered this guy, you know, that was his partner. He, mm-hmm. he doesn't care at all. All he can think about is, I really don't want that to happen to me. So yeah. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make so that uh, even if I have to give the land back. Right. He's still, like, you know, trying to weasel his way out of the curse Yeah. Uh, uh, with the least amount of effort possible. But then when he returns to that little uh, Amazon camp or, or, yeah. camp or whatever, he finds that he's way beyond redemption. Because Ken- Kettleman's already gone down to the village, and he's like, well, what's he doing down there? And he, he gets there, and Kettleman had brought some German guy with him. Uh-huh. And they were piling up the bodies of everyone in the village into this pit. Yeah. And he was like, well, you know, I told you these guys were susceptible to disease, so, you know, but still he's looking at the pile of bodies, and he can see that some of them have, like, bullet holes. And it's, which means yeah. that... Ne- not all of them died, you know. Right. Of these. So it's it wasn't a clean kill of all the tribe. And you get the feeling that it's kind of weird how how your sympathy is still just a little bit with Locke because you get the feeling that Kettleman and this German guy were trying to screw over Locke because he gets there and they're like, "What are you doing here?" Right. You know, like right. they they wanted to have this land for themselves and sort of screw Locke over so he doesn't get it anymore. And it's weird how. I found myself, you know, feeling like a little bit like, hey, you know, that's his land. <laughs> even right. though, you know, even though this guy is awful and despicable and that land belonged to the natives that they just wiped out. Exactly. And and let me let me just can I just rewind a little bit mm-hmm. and mention mention when uh, when Locke meets with Stump in the yeah. um, hospital room, yeah. there's a supernatural kind of scene that happens. Which, yes. Oh, yeah. We 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 forgot to mention that when Stump puts his hands on the glass and his 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 finger skin kind of like splits open and and you see he leaves like bloody handprints on the glass, but then Locke touches the glass and the blood is on his side. Yeah. 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 So and and um and in fact, Stump had said he's here, like he saw him standing there. The the old man, right. the old uh, native. Uh, elder, yeah, had been standing there, and of course Locke didn't see anything except for that he saw the bloody handprints on the other side of the glass, and he's right. just getting madder, angrier, and angrier because he doesn't uh, he doesn't want to believe that it's a curse. He wants to believe that it's a disease, and the people who got it somehow it was their own fault. Right, right, and and then Stumpf is telling him this isn't something you can control. This is something that. We we don't have any any option here, and uh, he gets mad. He he starts like pounding on the glass. That's when he breaks the glass, and the other guy, 
confronts him after he gets like all nicked and stuff from the the motes of dust and he dies and there's one funny thing in the comic book because um he accidentally killed stump of course and he he's left on the ground like bleeding from everywhere yeah and as he's walking out of the hospital really quickly uh in the comic book he 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 passes on the hallway by a sign that says donate blood oh <laughs> i didn't notice but that i'm gonna go back to yeah that. because it's written in portuguese so oh uh, the graphic novel you see he's passing by a little girl and a mother and in the background in the hallway it says uh you know donate blood and, and that uh, says how do you say that in portuguese um uh, I see, i'm looking uh, at it right now blood, so. is called, uh, blood is called sangu sangu yeah and, uh, and cola bore yeah it means uh please cooperate or please uh oh you i know, see yeah, so, so yeah, that that's that's that part I really wanted to talk about. Uh, <laughs> that's interesting from the comic. It's a nice detail. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, well, once he gets back to the camp, like you said, um, uh, Tettleman is there with that with that German guy, and the yeah. German guy is wearing gloves. They're white gloves, and they're full of blood. Yeah. As, and um, and you find yourself hoping that Kettleman and the German guy get this disease or curse also, but they yeah. probably won't. Yeah, but then uh, Tettleman, so like you said, Tettleman uh, says, well, you know, so what about Stump? And he says, Stump is dead. And Tettleman puts his hand on Locke's shoulder and he's like, well, you know, even less to divide up. Yeah. And, uh, and when he puts his hand on his shoulder, uh, you see that that. Locke's shoulder starts to bleed. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and then that's, that's the end. And so we know what's going to happen to Locke. We don't know if Kettleman and the German guy are going to get it also. Right. But yeah, well, I hope so. it, 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 if if there were justice, you know, in the world for this sort of thing, that then you know this this kind of thing would be happening. Mm-hmm. So that's that's um yeah that story that's a yeah, story for this one really kind of gives me the 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 willies i guess you know that that idea of something touches you and and your skin sort of sloughs off and you bleed everywhere it's just oh it's like the ebola virus you know oh yeah so tapping the vein uh comic book adaptation show up shows up in two different volumes from yeah the clip. yeah it's in tapping the vein you said volume five right Yes, volume and, five. And it's also um, probably, be, presumably because Yattering and Jack is a little short, so it's also at the end of the Yattering and Jack uh, mm -hmm. Eclipse graphic novel. It's illustrated by Hector Gomez, yeah. which has illustrated a lot of adaptations. And it's adapted by Steve Niles and Fred Burke, yeah. lettered by Willie Schubert. So, and, you know. And unlike The Life of Death, which is was, you know, deliberately kind of had a lot of drab color, uh, mm -hmm. this one is really bright. Uh, particularly, you know, a lot of green of the jungle and red from all the blood, and this one has oh, yeah. got a lot of bright primary colors in it. So it's a it's a kind of a different uh, a different style from uh, the life of death. I, I like this this uh, I like uh, Hector Gomez's style. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. It's not a it's not a fully painted artwork like. Uh, Rawhead Rex, for example. Yeah, <clears throat> but um, it's 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 very very. Uh, I have it's very, very, I have the Rawhead Rex one, and I haven't read through it yet. But as I was oh. paging through it, looking for the Twilight at the Towers one, I was I was just amazed at how cool it looks. <laughs> now I really want to go back and read it. Oh yeah, and yeah. It was it's it's expensive though. When you if you buy it on eBay, it's a lot of money for the Rawhead Rex one if you can find it oh. at all. But mm -hmm, it's worth yeah. it. I got it several years ago. Yeah. I yeah. got all the, the Eclipse um, graphic novels. I owned a I, lot I, of them I, in the I, 90s, and I sold them, and now I'm wishing that I hadn't because I'm buying uh, them back again. Right, right. Yeah. I, I would love to own a piece of artwork from the Rawhead Rex one. That would be pretty cool. The, that design uh, for Rawhead is awesome. It's so it different is. from uh, from any other drawings that we've seen, and, and uh, especially from the movie. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, the movie you can't even compare. Did you know that you knew that there was another design made uh, for Rod Rex? There was another adaptation for Rod Rex which never got made. Yeah, yeah. I think that was it. Uh, 
somebody had posted on the forum uh, a, a picture from that, a picture of Rawhead. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was originally meant to be adapted by um, I think it was Stephen Bissett. Uh. So uh, you know from Swamp Thing. I don't yeah. know if you ever. I don't know if you ever read. I have the Swamp. But, yeah, I know. I know what it is. Okay. So Ron Rex was supposed to be adapted by Stephen Bissett, and he did a lot of studies and you know like uh, cranial face studies for the monster, how his face would look like, how his jaw would look like. Yeah, and it's pretty cool. I mean, yeah, you know what? I'm going to add that to the show notes. Uh, yeah, that would be awesome. It doesn't really have anything to do with the Volume 6, but since Only we're mentioning really it. really tangentially, but. Yeah, since we're really mentioning it, I'm yeah. going to put up this link to a gallery full of designs for Rod Rex by Stephen Bissett. Because I, I really wonder what cool. happened where, where they had two, you know, two people lined up to do that graphic novel. Uh, what? I wonder how how it came about that uh, that they had you know him lined up to do the graphic novel and then it ended. Oh, up. because Bissett was the originally set to do that, but uh, that was years before the Eclipse graphic novel by. Uh, oh, so it just yeah. financially just didn't come together to make that er- earlier one. Yes, I guess I can look into it. Uh, we can discuss this later on another yeah. episode. Yes, yeah. uh, but I, I know there is. There is material available that explains some of that behind-the-scenes thing. Yeah. So we can definitely mention that sometime. All right. So that was uh, that was how spoilers bleed. Yeah. So next up, which one is it? Twilight at the Towers. Uh, so Mironenko, uh, or M. Ballard, is uh, the main character of this. He's sort of a British spy uh, during the Cold War era, and he's in Berlin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's meeting with a Russian defector spy called Mironenko, and yeah. this is this story is sort of full of spy intrigue, and it's it sort of changes over at a certain point in the story from a spy story to a werewolf story. <laughs> yeah, that's quite the twist. Yeah, yeah, that is quite the twist. That's pretty cool. Um, it almost. It kind of mixes like uh, Wolfman with the Manchurian Candidate or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean and and, uh, and Ballard finds that you know when he's met Mironenko and he's done a sort of a his own psychological analysis of Mironenko and he told everybody, "Yep, he's telling the truth. He really wants to defect." And they're all like, "Well." There's things you don't know about him, so we're going to take this over from here. And uh, and Ballard is like, what are you talking about? You know, I you don't trust me anymore? I've done this for a long time. And and uh, he goes tries to go find his old supervisor, I guess you would say, Cripps. And Cripps is missing. And there's bodies surrounding, what, surrounding Mironenko. And Ballard has sort of been... Uh, has become a target of his own organization. Yeah. And he's trying to get to the bottom of, of, of everything that's going on and, and with Mironenko and why is Cripps missing and, and uh, it sort of becomes this weird sort of spy intrigue and and these these dism- dismembered and disemboweled bodies are turning up and Yeah. It's almost like a kind of burn notice versus uh <laughs> Yeah. And and it's got a kind of a Cold War theme you know because it's like well the russians have got a program for for suppressing uh werewolves i mean this is giving away the you know what the plot is but the russians had a program for suppressing the werewolf instinct and making them forget and then you get an agent who's got these sort of super um instinctual kind of skills and so yeah. the, it's like, well, if the Russians are going to do that, then we in the West, you know, the British in this case, we're going to do it too. And so then Ballard, it turns out, is one of those as well. Yeah, Ballard has also become a little disenchanted with, with his own side. And, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, but then there's all the part that I mentioned about Manchurian Candidate is is also... Regarding a part in the story where um, the character uh, um, Ballard is um, Ballard is uh, confronted with his own nature, 
um, yeah. at one point. And as he knocks down the brainwashing barriers that were set on his uh, mind... Which sound like helicopters. Yeah, which sound like, like helicopters. a horrible headache and, and the sound of helicopters getting louder and louder. He starts to bleed from his ears and, you know, from his nose and all yeah. that stuff. And, because it's like they they've been blocked. Uh, they they they've had like fail safe blocks, mental blocks or something that been set in place because they've been brainwashed. And uh, well, it would be one of the ultimate, you know, uh, killing machine secret agents. I mean, you'd have someone who's going to be human, and then once you give them the trigger word, they would turn into a werewolf and kill everybody. And, you know, that would be a, 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 or, a weapon. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of got the feeling that they wanted them to be, they want these special people, but not so special that they actually turn into these uncontrollable werewolves. So it's like yeah. these people are, have, you know, really, really good instincts. Like Ballard can tell if someone's lying or not by sniffing them or, you know, and they, they want these people who are exceptional, but not so exceptional that they're out of control. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, basically, could there also be, like, a metaphorical side here? Like, these secret agents are, like, predators, and it's like they're literally predators in this story. And yeah. it's like they're wolfish in nature. And, yeah. and I, 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 you know, it's a story that – it's it's a good story. I'm, uh, it's I'm not exactly – it's hard to explain because it, it involves – like you said, it involves a lot of, like – Political intrigue and spy story in the in 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 the beginning, and it's almost like Babel's children. Yeah. It also has a lot of like international intrigue and stuff. And, and the, then the it kind of like makes it hard to remember what it is because there are no towers, and it's not really about Twilight except as a metaphor. I always figured Twilight at the Towers would have any, something to do with the final scene of the story where he. Uh, where he finds, um, like, his tribe, if that's yeah. what I... Like, it, it, it's cool. It's interesting. I'm, I'm going to be spoilery here because we've been yeah. spoilery the whole episode. And I'm just going to talk about the ending just here. Don't, which just is don't bleed. Best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be spoilery, but I'll try not to bleed. Yeah. Um, at the end, uh, we get to see this group of werewolves. Uh, which have started to band together, mm -hmm. and uh, and they actually have their almost like their um, own philosophy or their own religion or something, yeah. and they're actually quoting like a scripture or something at the and end. And that was, um, I think, that was Mironenko was reading from the Bible to them. I think it is. I think it is. And yeah. it's, it's a fascinating little uh, ending of the story. It's like. The, the comic book adaptation is great. I yeah. Mean, the comic book adaptation does a great job of simplifying the story. And, um, and again, it's illustrated by Hector Gomez, right? Yeah. Yeah. By the same guy who did uh, the, the spoilers lead. Yeah. So. Uh, and yeah, and, written, and the, the, written, the written adaptation is Steve Niles again. Yeah, it's a cool story. It's a, yeah. it's a cool story. And at the end, he finds Miranenko. Like preaching to his werewolf friends, um, yeah. and that, that's a fantastic um, element right there. And he, he, he's, they're actually quoting that says uh, they're using the quote um, from Genesis, mm -hmm. and it says, "And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air." And over every living thing that moveth upon the earth, and then it, it it has a wonderful ending line that says, "Somewhere near, a beast was crying." And you get this feeling like, okay, so these werewolves are going to start banding together, and they're going to start, you know, they're going to start going underground, and and it would be another tribe of fantastic creatures living on the earth, and eventually, it hints that they might try to take over the earth. Yeah. So. Uh, that, that that's a great ending there. Yeah. I mean, they repressed all the story, and then at the end, they finally find release and uh, and and community. So it was interesting reading this story now because I hadn't read it in probably twenty years, 
And yeah. I have to say that when I back when I read it in high school and junior high, I didn't understand. I mean, because Cabal was the first book that I ever bought, and it had all these stories on it. And you know, back in junior high, when I first read this story, I didn't understand it at all. All the spy intrigue stuff just went right over my head. Yeah, I think it was more of a MacGuffin just to introduce the mm-hmm. the secret agent as a werewolf and to yeah. introduce the notion of the state repressing the true nature of the people. Yeah. Because it's it's like there's this, you know, monolithic institution of the state that is so powerful that they actually brainwash these fantastic creatures that are werewolves yeah. and they subdue them. To right. something they can, you know, use, weaponize, or, yeah. you know, transform into secret agents. And they, they do this so well that it almost kills Ballard to turn himself into uh, a werewolf and into his own nature to find release of his uh, yeah. condition. But once he does, you know, he didn't want to believe it, and, and you know, and he, he, he didn't want to do it, but once he did it, he felt total freedom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so that's Twilight of the to- at the Towers. Um, you know that's it's another it's another interesting story, not one that sticks out you know amongst the best of the books of blood, but it's a good one. Um, yeah. Okay, so we sort of decided that the last illusion in Lord of Illusions is going to take up too much time. So we're going to save that for our next episode. So we'll kind of go on here really quick to On Jerusalem Street, a postscript. Uh, so that is uh, the obviously the, the sequel to the bookend story, uh, The Book of Blood. Um, we talked about that when we talked about uh, in, in Books of Blood, Volume 1 episode, we did yeah. talk about that movie and that story already, you know, just because you can't talk about one without the other. Uh, but here we are kind of come around, you know, full circle. Yeah. Um, and it's a really short story, so it, it'll keep the episode uh, up to the usual time. Yeah. Um, so basically, it's it's a wonderful little thing that Clive did, that he made these bookend stories. And... Um, this one ends with uh, the book, uh, Simon McNeil. Yeah. What do you think about Simon McNeil talking about himself in the third person? I was I just reading that, that again today, and, and I was trying to trying to kind of wrap my head around why, what was the point of that, or what you know, what why why that was happening. I think that he's become so inhabited and so haunted by so many voices inside himself that. He his persona is kind of like wiped away, and he's almost like he's become this um, detached fragment of himself, or yeah. uh, inhabited by the ghosts. That that was my thinking too, and 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 I what I couldn't figure out was is it that he's so possessed by these stories that he's lost sort of lost himself. Or are there really these ghosts are really inhabiting him and, and just talking about him as if he's not even there anymore? Or is yeah, it just think, that he's, his mind is broken from, you know, this experience that he's gone through? Maybe it's all of those things. Maybe it's all of those things, yeah. yeah. Like the first thing you said seemed pretty good. Like, because this guy keeps getting, uh, keeps being used by the, the dead yeah. as a conduit to tell them, to tell the, their stories to the world. And uh, if you saw the movie out there, listeners, if you saw the movie, mm-hmm. you will find that it's pretty traumatic being the book. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, pretty, it's, it's a pretty harsh uh, existence. Yeah. So and, this man, uh, why bird has come, you know, across the wall and snuck into his house to, uh, you know, and, and, um, and there's no pretense, you know, uh, he knows uh, he knows that Wybert is the, the the assassin has come to kill him and steal his skin to for for someone who had hired him that wanted it. Yeah, and it's almost a matter of fact thing that yeah. uh, the book he like looks at him and he says, "Oh, um, so have you seen enough?" And uh, he's looking at he's looking at the uh, he's looking at his his skin and he can see and he goes, "Oh, how did you get in?" And um, the, the, the Wybert actually asks 
McNeil, he says, why do you talk about the boy in the third person? And he actually replies, well, the boy hasn't been here for a long time. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of, a, it, yeah, it's not a real answer. It's just kind of a... It's almost like he got, he's lost it, yeah. you know. And Weinberg certainly it. thinks that he's just gone nuts. Yeah, he, he feels like he's giving him a, uh, making him um well, mercy he feels killing. like he's he, he's giving him a mercy killing. Yeah. Because he feels like, ah, oh, the boy is completely gone. And, you know, he doesn't really understand what's going on with his skin and yeah. probably thinks that he does it to himself or something. Yeah, and that and makes like, uh, it'll be like, oh, well, this is going to make my job easier. And he's there to kill him and skin him yeah. before he collects and so that's basically what he does. This story is like four or five pages long. It's just a, a postscript. So you can you can read it really in a matter of minutes. Yeah. And uh, it's basically very well adapted in the book, the yeah. in the, the book of blood, because with except, the with uh, the exception, of course, of the ending and who's behind the you know the hiring of the assassin. Yeah, it's not it's not the woman. It's not the uh, it's not the um, yeah, it's not the woman that was studying him because yeah. she she passed away in in the the first story. But um, and and of course, Weibert doesn't meet him at a diner. He goes to his place and breaks in. Yeah. And uh, uh, the rest is pretty much the same as the the movie. Yeah. Uh, he, the 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 suitcase with his uh, skin starts to bleed out. Starts to the blood starts to fill the room. Weiber has been sleeping for a bit. He was like getting some rest after skinning uh, the book. Yeah, he spent and, all night skinning him. Yeah, and he wakes up and he's got like blood, like you know, on his knee deep, and then it starts getting up, 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 and higher. And it's um, it's almost like that Johnny Cash song, "How high is the water?" And it keeps getting higher. And uh, he, he tries to open the suitcase, and the more he messes with the suitcase, the more blood comes out. Yeah. And uh, the door is locked. He can't get out. Um, in the movie, there was a window, but I don't think there was a window in the uh, in this short story. I don't remember. It's yeah. a small apartment, so I'm guessing there must there must have been some kind of window. But um, yeah, they didn't. You know, but in the, it was kind of a nice thing in the movie. You could see, for, look, you know, be looking in from the outside and see yeah, what's, it was what's happening. Cabin. Yeah. It was a little cabin in the movie. This one is an apartment, and uh, it says here he tried the bathroom door, but that was but that was locked and keyless. He tried the windows, but the shutters were immovable. Oh, okay. Uh, so the furniture starts floating around, and uh, so, and then he ex they kind of explain the narrator kind of explains what's going on. They say, well, the stories go on and on. The boy had said, they bleed and bleed, and uh, now he seemed to hear them in his head. Yeah. Those. Dozens of voices, each telling some tragic tale. And him the yelling out for help just sort of got drowned in with the uh, all of the stories that he was hearing. He added his own voice to the cacophony, begging for the nightmare to stop, but the other voices drowned him out with their stories. And as he kissed the ceiling, his breath ran out. So yeah. the voices drown his voice out, and he drowns in their blood. And he and, finds uh, himself on the on the highway, on the dead highway. Yeah, and, and he then, sees a man that's skinned, and the really interesting part is that it's not McNeil; it's some no. other guy that got skinned that wanted to tell his story. You know who I always thought it was? <coughs> Frank? No, Larry. Oh, Larry. Yeah, uh, or Larry Rory. Or, or Rory. You know, depending. Yeah, because he yeah. says the flayed man told him how he had come to this condition of his brother-in-law's conspiracies. Oh, wait. Oh, no, no, it's not, because it says his brother-in-law's conspiracies and the ingratitude of his daughter. Leon, in turn, told of his last moment. So it's not it's not Larry, but because uh, Frank was not his brother-in-law. <laughs> right, and, and, uh, and in the story, she wasn't his daughter. She was a friend. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's been a while since I read this book at that time. It, like you said, it was almost like 20 years since I read the book, except for the fact that I reread some stories for our episode. Yeah. In fact, you know, just a couple hours before the episode, I reread The Last Illusion, which yeah. I, I actually was looking forward to talking about. Me too. So we, uh, Me too, but I think it just, it, 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 
we wouldn't do it justice. We, you know, if we're all burned out and yeah, yeah, we we can definitely work on that next week. Yeah. Uh, so it actually it's nice because we spent two weeks with we spent three weeks without an episode and now yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll probably have... go through and watch it with because I watched the movie again, and I'll, I'll probably watch it with the audio commentary before next week. Excellent idea. I I'm going to do that too because I have the DVD with the commentary. Do you have the laser disc? Yes, but I don't have a laser disc player anymore. But it's the same. I... Com- it's the same commentary. I got the laser disc too. Um, recently, actually. Oh, the, with the black cover with the the the, the tarot card. You know, yeah, yeah. That's a really nice, uh, really nice laser disc. It's it's beautiful. It's a beautiful. I wish all the movies were like that. Yeah. You know, it's like they're making the movie boxes smaller and smaller. Yeah. And yeah, Blu-rays are even smaller now than DVDs. Yeah, yeah, and uh, wow, I I was just holding it in my hand the other day, the laser disc, Mm -hmm. and that thing is huge. Yeah thing is huge it's a huge like a huge cd or whatever do you have the the uh the hellraiser one that comes with the screenplay no that's no, I never... really good I, I mean if you're going to collect it, i would i mean there's nothing good about there's no really good nightbreed one but there's an awesome hellraiser laser disc box set topic is is nightbreed on laser disc at all it is yeah but it's one of those cheapo ones that's got you where you can see the you know, they took the VHS cover and put it down the middle, and then they put like little pictures of laser disc ends on the on each end. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Right. So, and I have the Hellraiser one that's like that, and I have the Hellraiser box set. Right. I I just have the uh, I just have Hellraiser on VHS, and then I have on DVD. I have that little Anchor Bay box. Oh yeah. That came in, uh, in the in. 2000 the, yeah the tin one two or four yeah no not the tin the uh the box the square box oh with hell one two and three. Oh, i didn't know about that one it's a four disc set huh. yeah um all right so so yeah. um that was it for for volume six of the books of blood except yeah. for last illusion and, yeah, Lord and of- we'll we'll uh we'll 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 put we'll put that one up next week yeah, so um, no questions or comments this time. I uh, just would like to go into that um, you can find us on the web at www.clivebarkercast.com. Uh, download the podcast on iTunes uh, and leave a review there. We got one review already. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. And, you know, more often you can find us on the Occupy Minion group where Jose and, and I are, are um, admins. And Roger too. Um, on Twitter, we're at BarkerCast, and we're also at, on the, the at Occupy Midian. Uh, the forum is www.timewins.com/clive/forum, and um, look and uh, www.occupymidian.com is up. And it's out there, and. Um, Go go to it. It's that's that w- website is going to keep on evolving and getting more and more stuff on it. Um, and you can find Crystal Rain at www.bringbacknightbreed.blogspot.com uh, to see more of what she's doing to kind of show the uh, to kind of you know she's she's collecting all the information and articles and stuff about Occupy Midian and about Nightbreed. So. All right, well, thank you uh, for joining us again. We're going to do another... Normally, this is a t- every other week we record, but we're going to finish this up with Last Illusion and Lord of Illusions next week. All right. Well, uh, thank you again for joining us, and we'll pick Pleasure. this up again next week to talk about Lord of Illusions and The Last Illusion. All right. Occupy Midian. Hi again. I'm back. Um, yeah, in the original airing of this episode... Uh, we had the song Bleeding by Venom right here. And in order to respect the rights holders again, we've removed it from the episode. I recommend you find Bleeding by Venom. It's on the Cast in Stone album. And give it a listen. Thanks for understanding. And this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. <laughs>